I feel like I ruined that moment there. Um, Welcome this morning. It's good to be with all of you here. Um, I love seeing our kids. I I, I love it on a a Sunday morning when we're wrapping up and you just kind of we're all hanging out and you just see kids running around everywhere going for the donuts. It just um, I love the families and I love the stories and I love just the vitality that they add to our community here. So we, um, if you've been around here very often, you know that um, we believe that um, our, 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 everybody is a part of the church family, um, no matter where you're at, what your story is, um, or what age you are. Um, in fact, we tell our, our middle school and our high school kids that this is, this is no longer, you're not a junior member, this is for you and that's for them as well so we're um, always glad to experience that together Uh, i don't know if you've ever had those moments i I, I imagine that you have had it sometime when um when you are in a a moment of of sort of lacking something or you're like for instance if you're particularly hungry you're just really hungry it's been a while since you've eaten and then you see food like how good it looks to you like how delicious, even something that maybe normally to you would be, I'm okay with it, or this is, a, you know, not my favorite. In that moment, when you're really, really hungry, it, it looks perfect. It looks um, so desirable to you. When I was uh, um, early on um, a student ministry pastor and I had taken this team of students down to Honduras. Now, like in the backstory here, you have to understand, like I was never that big of a fan of Wendy's the fast food restaurant, like my growing up for whatever reason, like that was the restaurant my parents chose whenever we had to like go out to eat. Like it was always Wendy's and I always, I always wanted to go someplace else, but they never did. Um, (laughs) Rough childhood, you know, and, and so flash forward, I'm an adult, I'm leading students on this, this trip in Honduras and this organization, one of their big points of focus was teaching kids leadership. So as a part of this trip experience, they would give the students various responsibilities and, and they would let them kind of manage them, sort of sink or swim. Like, and you just kind of, if, if they didn't prepare for something, you had to adapt and that sort of thing. And so there was a group of kids that were, they were responsible to plan the food for the whole team, the duration of the trip. And we would have to go out and do shopping and they would send other groups to go out and do that. And so on their plan, they had, they had this uh, idea of, of like a baked potato bar kind of thing, right? But you know, like in, in the United States, that's like a gigantic potato. Um, but in, in Honduras, when the kids that went shopping for the groceries, they were like tiny, tiny little potatoes. And the instructions said one potato per person, that the, the meal planning team. So, so we came to like dinner that night and litter, this is like a little like fingerling potato that, you know, and I was like, this is not good. Um, so I'm like, we survive, you know, the next day we're, we're leaving for the work site and the, um, the team that was responsible for the lunches packed everything, had it all set and go, but it, it forgot to put it in the trucks when we left for the site. And we get there and we realize like we have no lunch today. And there was no, like we were being transported by these different people. They didn't stay there. We had no transportation. They left. So we had a full work day with no food. All we had was, was water to drink and we were just starving. And at the end of the work day, there was like a kind of a VBS sort of camp with the kids. We were playing soccer, just running on empty, you know, and we are driving. This is in Sigue Tepeque, Honduras. We're driving back to our, um, our site. And, and I don't know why in Sigue Tepeque, Honduras, they have a Wendy's, but they do. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Literally, like at this point in time, I don't care what lessons the organization that we went with wanted to teach the kids. I didn't care about valuable like leadership opportunity. I was like, pull into that Wendy's, you know, and just bought like cheeseburgers for everybody. And, and it was so good because I was operating. I was living from a perspective of scarcity, right? And we've been, we're now in week three of this story of Ruth, uh, these two widows who are living and, and working and doing everything they can to merely survive in a situation where it feels like all the cards have been stacked against them. This story that we've been in is, is a story of both loss and hope. 
It's a story of scarcity, but also of generosity. It is a story of brokenness, but of redemption. Two people who knew scarcity firsthand. And yet God is in the midst of their scarcity. He's beginning to show them some things. And it's through that perspective that, that they're viewing what's happening around them. If you're new with us this morning, again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Sterling, by the way, if I haven't met you, I'm the campus pastor here at our Mill Creek campus. So just, just a little background into this. Uh, this woman, Naomi, and her husband, Elimelech, have they moved their entire family to a place called Moab because there was a famine in Bethlehem. Things go horribly wrong. Elimelech dies there, and uh, Naomi's two sons marry two Moabite women, and then both of her sons die. So you have three widows living in, in Moab who have very little means to provide for themselves. I mean, it's a, it's a desperate situation. So Naomi hears that, there's, that the famine has, has subsided in Bethlehem. She decides that she's going to uproot from Moab. She's going to go back there. And on her way back, she says to her two daughter-in-laws, hey, it would be better for you to stay here. The, 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 every chance for you to find some sort of fulfillment or joy in life is going to be back in Moab. And so she actually does this really loving thing where she releases them of any obligation that they have to her. Orpah, the one daughter-in-law, agrees. It's, it's a tearful goodbye. It's hard, but she says, I think you're right. Ruth, on the other hand, does this incredible, risky, faith-based thing where she says, I, your family, you are going to be my family. And Yahweh, your God, is going to be my God. And so despite going into the unknown, despite going to a place where I know no one, despite being an outcast and a foreigner in a land that's not my own, I am going to go with you. Last week, we picked up the story because now in the midst of the desperation, they're back in Bethlehem, but they have nothing. Ruth decides that she is going to go out and, and on her own attempt to provide as best she can for herself and for Naomi. And she finds herself in the field of a man named Boaz. And Boaz knows a little bit. He's from the clan of, or the family of Naomi, Naomi's husband actually, and he hears about how Ruth has demonstrated just this incredible faithfulness and love to Naomi, and so he just starts to like shower her with provision, blessing, abundance. And, and she's taking it all in, it leaves her asking the question like, why, what, why would you choose me? Why are you doing this? If you remember, this is back in Ruth chapter two, which is where we're gonna pick things up today. This is verse um, 11 and 12. It says, so Naomi asked the question, why? And this is Boaz's reply now. He says, I've, to I've been told um, all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and you came to live with a people who you did not know. And may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So at this point in the story, really, we're, we're still kind of in the beginning of this day. It's still very early on in, in this day. And so we're going to pick things up now in the second half of chapter two, after this expression of Boaz to Ruth, where he's saying, I've heard of your faithfulness, and I want to be a part of the story of, of God's provision and God's protection over both you and Naomi. And so now it is about lunchtime. This is in verse 14. It says, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. And she ate all that she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stocks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. And then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. And she carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what, was, uh, what she had left over after she had eaten enough. See, so 
When Ruth sets out in this day, when she thinks about what she's hoping for, her expectations, what's, what's gone on up to this point is, is far beyond anything she imagined or dreamed. In fact, the second half of this story, the second half of this day, it, it begins at a place of abundantly more. That's the first thing that we see in, in this exchange here. It's, it's abundantly more. Like, have you ever received an, an inappropriately large gift? Have you ever given one? Like, it, it, we don't sometimes know what to do in those moments, right? I was researching a little bit the, the largest gifts ever given. Like, I think the Taj Mahal was supposed to be like a gift to that guy's wife, which that seems a bit excessive. But the, the, one of the largest, most valuable gifts ever given was by the last Maharaja of the Sikh empire in 1849. He gave a 186 carat diamond to Queen Victoria. It's the largest diamond um, known. In fact, Prince Albert actually ended up having that diamond cut down to about 100, a little over 100 carats, and it's installed in the crown. Um, it, it's, so the Hope Diamond, which is about 45 carats, is valued at around $250 million, plus or minus, right? This, this is considered priceless. They don't even know how to, to put a price on this diamond. It's, it's the gift of extravagance, and it's given out of extravagance. And this is, this is what we see taking place here in this text. Re remember what... Ruth asked for when she first went out in the morning, what she was hoping for, what she might experience in that day. This is from, this is verse seven of, of chapter two. She said, uh, and this is when she's, the overseer is talking about telling Boaz about Ruth showing up. And it said that she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind your harvesters. P please let me just get some of the leftovers. Please let me go along and pick the things up on the ground that are left behind. This is what she's hoping for. This is her desire, but Boaz does so much more. He does abundantly more. See, when Ruth started her day, she had very little in the way of expectation. In fact, as a, as a Moabite widow living in a foreign land, working outside of the city, and we get this in the text, that, that her hope, her expectation of the day was that she might get a little bit to eat and have enough taken home to give to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and that she might avoid being assaulted. That that, for, in her mind, would have been a good day. But what unfolds are this expectation-shattering generosity. Verse 14, he talks, says, come over here, come, come join my family. Boaz invites her to sit with the workers, be a part of us. We talked about this last week when we talked about how Boaz created belonging for Ruth. Not only does he, he feed her until she's full, but he, he, he allows her to take all this roasted grain. He, he basically sends her home with like a, um, what do you call that? When you leave the restaurant and they give you that doggy, doggy bag. bag. Yes, like that was just gone. Like my brain was not <laughs> coming up with that. It's like it reminds me of when I would leave, like I would go home from college and we would have uh, Sunday church at, at, and I would go over to my grandma's for lunch. She lived where my family went to church and, and every time she would feed me until I could not eat more. And then there was this, this bag of la leftovers that she would send me with. Like this is the image of you get that Boaz, this loving generosity that he wants to provide or take more, go home with more. He goes on beyond that though. Says that, that Boaz then instructs that his workers that she is allowed to glean from the fields, that she has open access from what's gathered, but then he does this unique thing where he instructs his workers, hey, when you're gathering together the sheaves of barley, just every so often, just drop one, right? Just, just kind of walking along, lay one there. It's like when you're doing the Easter egg hunt for your kids when they're really tiny and you're just sick of them looking, you know? And so you're like, hey, look, buddy, there it is. You know, this is this, this generosity that Boaz is just pouring out to Ruth excessive in so many ways beyond expectation, beyond what's imaginable for them. And in fact, it says 
that, that when it was all accumulated, when she had gone back and, and, and threshed the barley, that it amounted to about an ephah, which equates to about 30 pounds of food. Like just so we have some, the, 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 a day's wages for a worker in the field was typically somewhere in the, in the ancient Near East culture going to be between a pound and two pounds of whatever they were picking. She's gathered 30 pounds of food. Like imagine her for a moment just, just trying to even get this home. Like you know like when you, you're like taking the groceries in from the car and you're like, I don't want to make another trip. And so you've got like six bags on every finger and your pinky's about to get ripped off because <laughs> you have the milk in that one. Like th- this, is, this is what you sort of picture for Ruth here. She's, she's supplied to overflowing. It's, it's, it's this picture of generosity all in a single day. Boaz here is, is choosing intentionally to be this instrument of God's grace in the lives of, of Ruth and Naomi. He does so by providing her with, with abundantly more than she could have ever envisioned, she could have ever hoped for as she went that morning to work in the fields. And again, I think this is so important here because what we're discovering is we're seeing God's activity. This is what the narrator wants us to capture. You're seeing God's activity, his character being displayed by the people in this story. We're we're seeing when we're talking about abundantly more, we're not merely talking about Boaz's generosity to Ruth. Where really what the narrator is wanting us to see is this generous God who sees and cares for and protects this person. And he's doing it through the means of of Boaz. I remember there's a story in the New Testament where Jesus is just so effectively captures the idea of God's abundantly more, the, the abundantly more of his grace. And he, he tells a story um, that is commonly referred to as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And he talks about how the one day the son wakes up and he decides he wants to control his own life. He wants to be in charge, set his own destiny. He essentially says to his father, you're dead to me. Give me my half of the inheritance. And his father does. He, he takes it off to a faraway place and he just squanders it. He lives recklessly, he he wastes all of it to the point where he finds himself living literally among pigs, eating from their trough, just in order to sustain himself. And in the midst of that moment, the son gets the idea of, look, the people that work on my dad's farm, they're, they're, they're so much better off than I am. They, 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 They have so much more than I do. So I know I have no right to go back and to to ask dad to take me back as his son, but perhaps, perhaps out of his generosity, he would take me back as one of his workers. And so he goes back with this plan. And there's this beautiful depiction that Jesus tells when when the father sees him coming down the lane and, and it says that he just runs to him. And this is the exchange that takes place in Luke chapter 15 between the son and the father. The son enacts his plan and he says to his father, I've sinned against you and against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And culturally, that was absolutely true. But the father said to the servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Do you see this This description this picture of the abundantly more of grace here's all he could hope for was maybe my dad will give me a job and that would be so much better than what I have but Jesus depicts this loving father who responds with grace and out of his love and this thing is that Jesus the reason he's telling this story is he's helping us understand that this is how God feels about you This is what he has for each of us and yes it's his grace is extravagant and yes, and, and from our, if we can say it this way, it, it's, it's, it's inappropriately extravagant. Over the top. We can't earn it. There's nothing that we can do that matches it. But he gives it. 
He gives it freely to each and every one. It's the abundantly more of his grace, his character. In fact, we'll get to this in just a second, but Ruth, or Naomi, when Ruth returns with this supply of food, she says, like, where did you work today? Like, whose whose fields were you in? Because she's just shocked at, at this supply. And this, by the way, this is that first sort of shift in Naomi throughout this story. Up up to this point in time in this story, she has remained pretty convinced that she is going to be forever outside of God's blessing, That, that, that God had abandoned her. And now perhaps for the first time she's thinking, maybe this isn't the end of the story. Now for, for the first time she's asking herself, maybe there is reason to hope. The second thing that we discover in this interaction, though, is is what I'm going to call a loving kindness. A loving kindness. Let me pick it back up in in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to look at 19 and the beginning of 20. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, asked her, where did you glean today? Where, Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about one about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said, and the Lord blesses him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. When I grew up, I, I, I grew up in a family of all boys, um, and I was always um, compared to my dad. We had sort of physical similarities. Our gestures were the same. We had that same dry sense of, of humor. In fact, some of my dad's aunts and uncles, would, they would be come home to like be at my grandma's house and it would be like a family reunion. I can still remember some of them calling me Little Dave. Little Dave. Like there's this resemblance, this, this something that you recognize. Like they're that's pre-beard days. And, um, but, but you can capture, I think, a little bit in that picture, like some of why people saw that in us. There was things about me that resembled who he was, right, that were, that were a part of this. Hold on to that for a second, because when, when Naomi speaks, she says here, the Lord bless him, speaking about Boaz, But then she says, he has not stopped showing his loving kindness to the living and the dead. Now she's speaking about Yahweh. She's at least speaking about her God through the experience of what she's received through Boaz. See, Naomi now, for the first time in the story, she's starting to connect the dots. And for for her, it's being realized in these expressions, these encounters of, of what the author calls loving kindness. And this isn't the first time Naomi has noticed this. If you flip back to chapter 1 in verse um, 8 and 9, or verse 8 at least, it says, Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, and may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown your kindness to your dead husbands and to me. She, this is that same word. She, she is wishing, she's asking, like she recognizes one, this experience of this loving kindness in her daughter-in-law's faithfulness and commitment to her. And then she prays for it, for them, that they might experience it as they're going to part ways. See, last week, if, if you were here, we talked about how in, earlier in chapter two, there's this Hebrew word that's translated favor into the English. And in that Hebrew word, there's, there's a lot of depth and there's a lot of, of meaning that is hard to uh, capture succinctly in, in the English. And the same is true for this word translated loving kindness. It's the Hebrew word hesed. Has said is 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 different, uh, difficult to translate because it's so it's it's multifaceted. It, it conveys really like a, a cluster of ideas. It is love, but it's also loyalty. It's it's grace. It's it's mercy. It's kindness. It's commitment. It's and all of that. All of these qualities sort of wrapped up and expressed in action. Put put into action. 
Hesed is that, that quality in someone that moves them to act for the benefit of someone else without regard to, to what they might get out of it and, and really in some ways in, in regard to what it might, without regard to what it might cost them. So Hesed in the, in the Hebrew faith, this is, this is born out of the character of God. It's, it's, it's uniquely God-like. And so the display of Hesed in relationship is an expression of who God is. It's how we put him on display. Uh, Carolyn Curtis James in, in her book, The Gospel According to Ruth, she describes Hesed in, in this way. She says this. She said, Hesed is not driven, excuse me, Hesed is driven not by duty or obligation, but by a deep, a bone deep commitment, a loyal, selfless love that motivates a person to do voluntarily what no one has a right to expect or ask of them. They have the freedom to act or walk away without the slightest injury to their reputation yet they willingly pour themselves out for the good of someone else. It's actually the kind of love that we find most fully expressed in Jesus. In a nutshell, she says, Hesed is the gospel lived out, and now Naomi is, is starting to see it. She's starting to experience it. She's starting to see that, that Ruth's unwavering faithfulness to her wasn't merely the commitment of, of a kind and loving daughter-in-law. It's the compassion of her God. She, she's beginning to understand that Boaz isn't just this benevolent benefactor who's decided to, to be generous, but rather it's the tangible experience of God's generosity and provision to her. Remember in, in chapter one, Naomi said as she's returning to Bethlehem and it says she returns, she left empty, she returns, or she left full and she returns empty. And as she's coming back into this community that knows her, she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. And now this same Naomi is beginning to see that perhaps God did not abandon her to Moab. Because, because Ruth and Boaz are displaying chesed, this loving kindness as a reflection of the love and care of her God directly to her. It's, 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 only, those, it's only those of us who have experienced the abundantly more of grace, who, who have known for ourselves the hesed, the loving kindness of our God, who are able then to, to reflect it to others. You see, this is, this is how when we display this in relationship to, to each other, th this sort of over-the-top, selfless, expression of, of, a, of, a, of a loving kindness, when we live that out in context to each other, this is how we say, I'm related to him. Like, he, he's my dad. And, and people see that, right? They, they, they see that and they look and they say, okay, there's something that's here. This is the call for us as followers of Jesus. This is the vision of, of our church. This is when we talk about the idea of, uh, many of you know this, maybe some of you don't, the name Chapel Street is not based on being a building that was on a street named Chapel. It's that each and every one of our homes is our prayer might be a chapel on our street, might, might be a place where our neighbors, you and I, are this expression of hesed love to the people that God has put around us in our circle of influence that they might see something in us that is uniquely godlike and that that might ultimately communicate to them how much our god loves them ruth ruth and naomi could have never imagined what this just this one single day would contain this this experience of abundantly more this 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 experience of this loving kindness but it doesn't end there the good news doesn't end there because there's one more observation that, that Naomi makes, and that is the observation of a redeemer. A redeemer. Ruth chapter 2, back in verse 20 now, when she said, um, the Lord bless him, Naomi says. He's not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, speaking now of her God, of Yahweh. She added, this man is our close relative. 
He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay here with my workers until the harvest, until they finish harvesting all the grain. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. And so, as, so Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. The story, the story now takes this, 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 this turn. I, uh, I, I grew up in a little town called Eaton, Ohio. And, um, and right next to us, our, our next door neighbor uh, was a man and a couple by the name of um, Ralph and Darlene. Just, so when I was a little kid, he was probably in his 70s or 80s. And, um, and I had no like social barriers at all. And so I would go, he would sit out on his front, por- uh, front porch and, and smoke his pipe. And I would just go sit with him. And I had a, a speech impediment. I couldn't say ours, so I said wise. So I'd just say, Mom, I'm going to go talk to Yalf. I'm going to go talk to Yalf. And I'd be sitting out there, and he was half deaf, and I couldn't talk. And so <laughs> I would just sit there chit-chatting it up. He had no idea what I was saying ever. But Ralph would, would see sometimes when growing up in a house of all boys, we were rough and all those sorts of things and had a tendency to, to break some of our toys. And Ralph would go out, and he would take... Sometimes when my mom had put something out in the garbage, he would, he would take it out of the garbage and take it back into his shop and, and, and do whatever it was that we'd done. And we'd come back, it would be in our porch, just in perfect working order. Ralph was, was a fixer. He was a, a fixer of broken things. See, I don't, I don't know if you've picked up on this, but the, the narrator here, as he's telling this story, as it continues to develop, he, he keeps giving us these little glimpses of, of hope of what awaits, of what's coming. And now as we enter into this next scene of the story, once again, our eyes, our, our awareness is opened up because Naomi, who previous to this time has been uh, just, God has abandoned us, is sort of like, let's live this out and... and and she almost kind of communicates to her daughter-in-law, you, you made a mistake to even go back with me. She has a sense of almost like she's, she's cursed, right? But now she sees this incredible display of God's provision and protection of this, this loving kindness of, of Boaz, of her daughter-in-law. And then she says, wait, wait, wait. This man, this, this person, this field that you are in today, this isn't a stranger. In fact, he's, he's a family member. He's, he is one of the people in line who is able to rescue and redeem our family, to restore us. You, you can almost feel Naomi's entire countenance begin to change. These, these, the way that she's looking at her life, at her circumstances, frankly, the way that she's looking at herself and at her God is, is beginning to change as this sprout of hope now truly begins to emerge. I'm, I'm not today going to go into depth about the significance of Boaz being this guardian redeemer. That's, that's going to make up a lot of what we talk about next week because that's going to continue to develop. But what I will say is that, is that this is a provision that God put in place in the Old Testament specifically for the purpose of, of when tragedy strikes in a family, having a way for someone to come in and to redeem the situation, to restore it, to, if you will, to fix broken things, broken people. It was, it was meant as a, a protection. So if there was an injustice, this, this guardian redeemer could come in and, and be the one who works to, to restore justice. If there was a death in the family, the guardian redeemer could come in and, and could bring or purchase the land of Elimelech or the family in order to make sure that they had a means to continue to live on. It was a provision that was intended to, to restore and to rescue. See, Naomi, at the outset of this story, looks at her brokenness and she has come to the conclusion that God hates her. That the, 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 the only way to reconcile what she has experienced 
is that somehow she has so offended her God that he has been forced to abandon her. And yet, once again, we have this unique perspective, right? As, as the narrator is telling us this story, we get to see this through the lens of Ruth and Naomi as they're battling into the unknown, but then we get to kind of be lifted up to sort of that 50,000 foot view that allows us to see the providence of a God that, that, that Ruth did not end up in the fields of Boaz by some lucky circumstance, but that that was God's provision and provide. It was God working ultimately, as we're going to discover, to redeem and to restore brokenness. It's the powerful revelation of the God of abundantly more, whose grace is much bigger than our need, who, who acts out of his loving kindness. And here's the thing that I want us to hear this morning is that this is, this is who he is. This is what he's done for you. This, this, this abundantly more of grace, this, this hesed loving kindness, this is how he feels and acts towards you. Even when we don't see it, when we don't understand it, when we don't have the perspective of, of how he is working and moving. He feels the same about you. In fact, as we're going to discover, he provided for us a far superior guardian redeemer um, through his son, Jesus Christ, who, who, who himself would come to, to work and to move and to act with no regard to, to what it would cost him in order to redeem and restore our own brokenness. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this, this continued story. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity today just to look at and understand these experience of, of the abundantly more nature of grace, of the, the loving kindness that, that was discovered and seen through human interactions, but was a reflection of who you are and your character and how Ruth and Boaz are just putting this on display and how it's just transforming Naomi. Lord, I pray that the same would happen here. I pray that you would continue to work and move in such a way, Lord, that we would understand more of you, that we would know and re recognize your loving kindness put on display to us. And Lord, I pray that you would mobilize us to be the same agents of that loving kindness to the world around us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.